This film describes the strikes conducted against North Vietnam by United States surface forces during 1972. In conjunction with both Linebacker 1 and Linebacker 2 air campaigns, cruisers and destroyers conducted hit-and-run coastal raids in the face of hostile fire, a type of warfare rarely employed in modern times. This was a radical departure from the traditional role of naval gunfire, as employed in World War II, for example, to achieve intense, concentrated, but fairly brief shore bombardment during amphibious operations and for open ocean battle against other navies. Even during Korea, when naval gunfire was used to supplement artillery and air bombardment in close support of ground troops and for harassment and destruction of North Korean coastal targets, patrols were carried out deliberately, not on the run. The objective of the naval gunfire strikes was in consonance with the overall goal of linebacker, the destruction of enemy lines of communication. Coming at night as well as during bad weather, the surface strikes were designed to contribute both to the interdiction and psychological impact of the linebacker air war. On the 1st of April, 1972, less than a week after the start of the communist invasion, surface strikes, which had been suspended since the bombing halt of 1968, resumed against North Vietnam. Now, these strikes initially went under the name of Freedom Train, and then after 10 May, Linebacker. Within a week and a half, 7th Fleet ships were striking coastal targets ranging from the demilitarized zone to Haiphong. With only short irregular interruptions for typhoon evasions or demands for other operations, the surface war would continue daily until 15 January 1973. During Linebacker 1, operations were conducted by two task units, Task Unit 77.1.1 and Task Unit 77.1.2. Operationally, the actions fell into three broad categories. Task Unit raids against specific targets from the DMZ to Haiphong. Merchant ship surveillance, interdiction against waterborne logistics craft or WBLCs, and target of opportunity attacks at the Hanla Island Anchorage vicinity. And finally, special strikes. Let's look at these three types of operations in detail. Task unit raids against specific targets from the DMZ to Haiphong usually consisted of three to four destroyers with a six or eight inch cruiser at times. The largest number of ships ever used was 14. Because of the air threat from MiGs, at least one of the destroyers had to be a DDG equipped with surface to air missiles. Only ships with more than one gun mount were allowed to participate in shore bombardments. Thus, only DDG-2, DDG-35, Fram DD, DD-931, and DD-945 class destroyers, and the cruisers Oklahoma City, Providence, and Newport News saw action on these raids. Because the considerable hostile fire encountered by the units were assumed to be optically directed, and also due to the MiG threat, nighttime strikes became the rule after mid-April. After rearming and refueling during daylight, and remaining in a holding area, the unit would schedule an average of two to three strikes at night. The unit would form about 40 miles offshore an hour or so before the scheduled strike time. The task unit would then begin its run-in, reaching a top speed of 27 knots as it came within gunfire range of the CD or coastal defense sites. Nearing the coast, the task force would make several course changes or zigzags and dispense chaff to clutter possible enemy radars. The task unit would then slightly reduce speed and commence firing. Targets included POL, petroleum oil lubricant depots, military supplies and facilities. 
After the last round had been reported fired, the strike commander would immediately order the task unit into its retirement course so as to space out ships and gain distance from the coastal guns. Ships' batteries were kept unmasked for possible counter-battery fire and to complicate coastal defense fire control. A ship with an aftermount was generally stationed at the end of the withdrawing column, which retired at full speed until out of coastal defense range. The second type of surface operation, merchant ship surveillance and WBLC interdiction against offloading attempts at the Han La Island anchorage area, was conducted exclusively by Task Unit 77.1.2, the Southern Task Unit. Chinese merchant ships sought to offload here after the pocket money mining campaign of North Vietnamese ports on 9 May. This policing consumed a great deal of surface time and effort. To decrease the threat from the Han La coastal guns, the ships operated outside their range during the day. Active interdiction was carried out at night. Day or night, when the ships received hostile fire, they returned counter-battery fire and evaded to seaward. Unlike the strike operations, the WBLC interdiction employed no hit-and-run tactics. Instead, the unit operated continuously in the same general area at various ranges from the coastline, depending on visibility, time of day, or level of threat. Here, the emphasis was on surveillance, which involved WBLCs, anti-aircraft sites, and storage and interdiction targets. A third surface category was the special strikes, conducted irregularly against certain special targets. Four separate raids on Dosan Peninsula near Haiphong, for example, were aimed at valid military targets such as POL depots, but also for diversion, harassment, and as a psychological show of force. Opportunities to hit transient but lucrative targets were also exploited. And finally, special strikes were conducted at coastal defense sites around Han La when their surface or anti-aircraft fire reached an intolerable level. The first strike at North Vietnam took place on 5 April with gunfire directed at the Ben Hai Bridge and surface-to-air missile site just north of the DMZ. Soon after, the two task units were striking in the northernmost limits of North Vietnam, as well as at Dong Hoi, Vinh, Ton Hoa, and the Do San Peninsula. Considerable hostile fire from coastal defenses answered the ships, but U.S. forces received no damage. However, this would change drastically just two weeks into the campaign. On 17 April, USS Buchanan, DDG-14 received a direct hit during a strike in Brandon Bay, resulting in one man killed and four wounded in action. On 19 April, one of the year's major encounters took place and became known as the Battle of Dong Hoi Gulf. While carrying out a daylight raid against supply targets around this southern panhandle city, Task Unit 77.1.1 was engaged by two MiG-17s. Their first ordnance was aimed at Oklahoma City, but missed. However, one of the MiGs scored a direct hit on Higby's Mount 52, which had been evacuated because of a hang fire. Luckily, no casualties resulted. Later on that same occasion, one, perhaps both, of the MiGs were downed by Sterrett's standard missile. As April came to a close, 7th Fleet assets were being rapidly augmented for a greater effort. The cruiser Providence was chopped to fleet control, followed by Newport News carrying nine 8-inch barrels, biggest naval guns then active in the world. May was ushered in with a bang. Hansen, DD-832, suffered minor topside damage from an airburst during a strike in Brandon Bay. This was followed on the 5th of May by a direct hit by a dud projectile which lodged in Hansen's weapons office and failed to detonate.
Six days later, the same ship received shrapnel damage topside during a strike at Tan Hua. Thus, Hansen became the most frequently hit ship during the campaign, though not the most severely damaged. On 9 May, a six-ship cruiser-destroyer strike against the Dosan Peninsula was carried out. It was the sole occasion when all three Seventh Fleet gun cruisers, Newport News, Oklahoma City, and Providence, fired together. Throughout the morning and evening raids, hostile fire was intense. Buchanan participated in both strikes and was exposed to over 1,400 rounds of artillery fire, probably the highest volume of CD fire for a single ship since World War II. By June, pocket money had sealed off North Vietnam from the sea. However, the offshore island anchorages at Han La and Han Nhu were left unmined. On 4 June, Task Unit 77.1.2 began its full-time surveillance of Han La to prevent Chinese merchant ship offloading. At Han Nhu, interdiction was assigned to TAC Air, partly because of the greater coastal defense threat there. While at Han La, Strauss was damaged and disabled by an underwater explosion later determined to be a mislaid Mark 36 destructor mine. This type of mishap would occur several times later, notably on 17 July, when Warrington, DD 843, was so badly damaged by a probable mine explosion, she had to be decommissioned. On the positive side, a Saratoga A7 pilot was picked up by Wiltsey while operating off the Han La area one of two coincidental search and rescue services performed by the ships during the campaign. Perhaps the single most productive linebacker naval gunfire strike took place at Vinh Quang during daylight, 8 August. In their last combined operation, the two task units fired 128 rounds on target with 286 rounds counter-battery against CD sites. 750 rounds of hostile fire were received, but no damage was suffered. Later, it was revealed that the raid had blown up 100,000 rounds of artillery ammunition. Toward the end of October, when the linebacker one stand down was ordered, the United States surface effort declined markedly. During linebacker two, Naval gunfire missions were planned to coincide with the Linebacker II night air attacks against the Hanoi Haiphong area. These missions were designed to add further psychological impact to the intensity of U.S. strike operations. A total of 18 firing missions on 13 targets were conducted during the 11 days of Linebacker II. The targets attacked included bridges, army barracks, a storage area, and coastal defense sites. The last battle damage incidents occurred during the second half of December. On the 19th, the Goldsboro DDG-20 received a direct hit that resulted in two killed and one wounded. The final round impacted in North Vietnam on 14 January 1973 from USS Turner Joy, DD-951, one of the two original participants in the Gulf of Tonkin incidents in August 1964. Overall, during the linebacker surface campaign, the Fleet Rehabilitation and Modernization Destroyer, or FRAM, was the most prevalent ship type, both at Han La and elsewhere. But exclusively along the coast, the twin-gun 5-inch 54 DDGs and three-gun 5-inch 54 DDs of the 931 and 945 class accounted for the most missions and expended the highest number of rounds because of their high rates of fire and extended range capabilities. Newport News was one of the most valuable ships to operate in the raids. With her three triple 8-inch 55 turrets, and six twin 5-inch 38 mounts, the ship was equivalent to an entire strike force, sporting 21 gun barrels 
and capable of striking three targets simultaneously. By contrast, the six-inch light cruisers Oklahoma City and Providence, although delivering a larger payload, had a much slower rate of fire, no guns aft for counter-battery fire, no air burst capability, and no real range advantage. In this respect, they could be matched or even outgunned by the multiple barrel 5-inch 54 DDGs. Assistance in spotting, that is, adjusting the gunfire to bring it on the target, did not occur frequently and was not a major factor in the surface strikes. Most of the strikes were at night when spotting was very difficult. And naval gunfire targets often were in the proximity of heavy anti-air defenses. In this environment, spotting would have been hazardous. Also, naval gunfire targets were often some distance inland, too remote and dangerous for spotting. Even when spotting was feasible, there was generally a shortage of experienced airborne assets, either helicopter or tack air. There were, in all, over 5,500 surface missions during linebacker with over 150,000 rounds fired. Gun damage assessment was difficult since almost one third of the firing was long range, 20,000 yards from the target. However, nearly 700 secondary explosions or fires were reported. A total of 94 WBLCs were listed as damaged or destroyed. Seven unidentified surface contacts were destroyed or damaged. 17 warehouses were destroyed, and the raids damaged or destroyed many coastal defense sites. In summary, the surface raids no doubt contributed to the linebacker effort against the North by providing additional firepower. The surface units operated at night and in bad weather, striking when aircraft could not be used effectively. They not only inflicted damage on the enemy's war machine, the notable example being the destruction of the Vinh Quang ammunition dump, but they also tied up substantial amounts of the enemy's large caliber guns, many of which might otherwise have served as anti-aircraft weapons. Along with tack air and helicopters, the ships hindered input of Chinese supplies in the unique Han La operation and destroyed much of the shore-bound cargo. However, the impression remains that the ships may not have been used very effectively as weapons systems. Tying up three destroyers to thwart offloading from a single merchant ship, for example, raises the question of overall cost effectiveness. Also, for the coastal raids, the damage inflicted by an average of three destroyers firing while zigzagging at high speed and using only navigation inputs for fire control may have been small in relation to effort expended and risk incurred. And finally, the surface force encountered no significant enemy threat except for the intense coastal defense fire, the major source of ship damage, and the occasional daytime appearance of MiGs. The shore artillery appeared not to be radar directed. Virtually no surface to surface missile incidents were reported. And unlike the North Koreans during the 1950s, the North Vietnamese did not resort to mine warfare. The linebacker surface campaign presents two issues for consideration. Should the United States Navy plan for and equip its ships for the type of surface warfare conducted during linebacker? And if so, what improvements would be likely to enhance fleet capability? For example, rocket-assisted projectiles, guided bombs, remotely piloted aircraft for spotting and GDA, and improved point defenses. <laughs>